tonight I have uh, decided to uh, talk about some updates on new materials for the restoration of full arch uh, rehabilitations. Something we all need to know that our population is aging. People are living longer. In the when I started practice, the average lifespan of a, of a human being was down seventy five. Today, the average lifespan is 85. People are living longer and they maintain their teeth longer and they have some specific needs um, as, as uh, elderly. There is a rapidly increasing patient base and there is an increasing complexity of patient care. Um, you know, these people that are living longer, when 50, they had some implants here and there. Now they're in their 80s. The implants are still there, but their natural teeth have given up. And they, what they have, so they have some different needs than the young generation. And there's also an explosion of modern technology. There's, and I'm sure you, all of you know that there's a lot of materials coming out on the market every single day. And, and we have just to just keep up and with the technology. And it's a lot of work for us to do. But all these new materials are for our advantage. Materials are improving, techniques are getting better. The lab technicians are getting more sophisticated, and all of this is benefiting not only us, but benefiting first the patients, getting quality, high quality dentistry. If you look at complete edentialism globally, you notice that more than 240 million people are partially uh, and completely edentulous worldwide. But you notice that if you take a chunk between 65 and 74 year old with a loss of natural teeth, you notice that there's a, a huge differences between the globes, um, between the continents, I mean. If you look at the North American continent, or if you look at Europe, Africa, Asia, or, or Australia, you notice that there's a huge differences. In if you look at us, we, we, we know that 37 million Americans are completely edentulous. And 26% are between the age of 65 and 74. 30% are African-American, 26 are Caucasian, 24% are Hispanic. But there is a wide range in edentialism between states. So for example, Hawaii have a 13% edentialist rate. If you go to Kentucky, it's 47. So you can't really generalize because every state is different. There's a huge population that is then the concept is wrong. There's a lot of people that need dentures, and there's a lot of people that will still need dentures. And it's important to learn um, the fabrication of dentures uh, because um, you're going to have to start with making dentures if you want to pursue uh, to get a hybrid. So, edentulism sure and then we know that edentialism remains a challenge for for the patients and for us and it's a grown public health now between 1988 and 2002 there was a six percent reduction in complete edentialism but there is a steady need for treatment due to people living longer now on the on the right side of your screen, you know these are all my patients, and you notice the the youngest is ninety one years old, and then among all of these, the majority are still living. We probably lost five of them. So again, people are living longer. Um, economically, um, affluent baby boomers account for twenty percent of the U.S. population. These people have money, and these people are willing to spend their money on implants and on hybrids. And they are driving the future market growth. There will be a continued growth of edentulous patients and then an increased demand for complete dentures in the next 30 years. In 2019, only 314,000 Americans underwent full arch procedures. So there is still room for implant fixed complete dentures or hybrids, but there's also still room for traditional bar restorations. And the reason why I'm saying that is because not every single patient can afford to have a, a, an implant fixed complete denture. Some of them, they might only can only afford a bar and an over denture. That's why you also need to be um, comfortable doing that type of treatment. So if you look at the dental technology, 
the, the, the statistics are, are scary. There's only 14 CODA accredited dental lab program that exist in the United States. And because of this professions behind the scenes work, recruiting students is becoming very difficult. Now, if you look at this um, graph, you notice that the number of students in blue or dentist is getting bigger and bigger. And you look at the number of dental technology, um, um, it, it's get, getting lower and lower. So there is a shortage of qualified dental lab technicians. And that what mostly pushed the labs to go into um, digital technology and CAD CAM. And, and because it, you don't need that many people to in your lab to, to work, um, to do all these different steps that we used to do. So why did we go digital? Because you have a shorter production time, superior fit, less lab steps, decreased potential for errors, superior strength, superior quality, a repository of digital data that you can keep. So in case you need to redo something, you have the data in there, you just have to pull it out and then mill the, the crown or the denture again. There is a reduced treatment length for the dentist and a reduced number of interfaces. So for the digital prosthetic planning workflow, what you need to do is basically grab an impression, whether an analog impression or a digital impression, it doesn't make a difference. Now, the other thing is you need to do a verification jig. Now, this is crucial when you're doing all these full arch restorations because you wanna make sure, or the lab technician needs to make sure that your cast is as accurate as your mouth. Because if your cast is not, and the, the, the lab technician is gonna mill for you a framework for your hybrid or a framework for your bar, they might not fit intraorally. And because it's titanium, it's excessively, practically impossible to, to solder that material. In the old days, we used gold, it was easy to, to solder and adjust. But with titanium, it's, you, know, you have to make a new framework. So that's why the, the lab kind of requires a verification jig to make sure that your framework is, um, that your cast is adequate. Then after that, you need a, um, uh, an angle abutment to adjust the access hole of your screw. The prosthesis is designed by the lab technician and mailed, and it's sent to you for trial. Now, after that, you're gonna have to take um, a centric relation record, check the vertical dimension, and then, and then make sure that everything Goes, goes on the right track from there. So the guidelines for decision makings are basically two. There's some functional factors that you need to take into consideration, but there is also some aesthetic factors that you need to evaluate to make sure that you're going on the, on the right track. So when you get a patient like this, so first of all, it's very difficult to assess the vertical or the prosthetic uh, space. Now, it, it, it takes a lot of work to get that done, specifically if the patient is partially a dentalist, like this patient on the left side. Now, ideally, you want to get these teeth cleaned, and then once the patient heals, then what you do is you, you fabricate some wax rims, and then, then you can ad adjust the, the vertical space and then get the lip support and then figure out where the midline is um, and all the, the other um, data that the lab technician requires to fabricate for you um, a decent uh, a trial denture. Because that trial denture is gonna be like a guide for not only for the placement of the implants, but also for the fabrication of the final prosthesis. So the first thing you wanna do if a patient is a dentalist is start with a complete denture. So whether it's conventional or digital and microdental uh, can fabricate both. I have an excellent um, relationship with Rob Cryer, who, uh, with whom I work on my digital dentures, and, and I hi highly recommend that you at least try it once, and you will fall in love with that um, digital dentures, and this is all what you will be doing, because that's all that I'm doing now in my practice is digital dentures. They can either be mailed or printed. Uh, this is a different topic now. I'm not going to get into that, but I am into the mail system. I don't like the printed dentures for so many reasons, but we can't discuss that for now. Um, I have published um, a couple of articles on that topic. If you have any interest, just let Mr. Sabellus know, and I will be more than happy to share with you the, the manuscript. The first thing you do is data gathering 
Do you want the shade? You want the uh, enter um, ALA measurement? Uh, you want to measure also the um, vertical dimension of occlusion, the vertical dimension of rest. And if your patient has existing dentures, you just use um, an, an ALA gauge, um, an ALMA gauge, I mean, and then what you can do is get that number that you require. Um, the impressions could be either made analog or digital. Then you send the data to, to the lab. Now, if you do uh, analog, they have to pull the model and fabricate some wax rims that you have to adjust in the mouth, grab a centric relation record. And then from there, the lab digitizes your wax rims and take you to the digital world. And if you use digital impressions, the, the, the data is sent directly to the lab. And then the design of the denture is made. Then what you have to do is make a decision on the material. You want an iVotion dentin base or a simple iVotion. And the difference is the iVotion dentin base, the teeth are milled separately, the base is milled separately, they bond it together and they milled to final. The iVotion is a puck that has white, the, the white for the teeth on one side and the pink for the base on the other side, and the denture is milled in one piece. So it's a monolithic denture. Then after you decide on the material, the dentures are milled and they polished by the lab technician and sent to you. Well, let me share with you how that, that functions. So this is a three appointment workflow, a completely edentulous patient uh, presented to the office um, and wanted to start the treatment on the spot. What I do is I use these Wagner universal impression trays. And basically um, these are a, like a type of compound material um, like the green stick compound, you put them in hot water, they become malleable. And all that you do is you mold them in the mouth. You can adjust them with scissors. You can bottom mold them. And you can use them with any impression material that you're comfortable. Now, I use uh, polyvinyl siloxane. And then what I do is I make an impression for the maxilla and the mandible. I pull my cast, fabricate the wax rims, try them in the mouth, adjust them. And basically, the lab technicians to take you from the, the analog world to the digital world he's going to need some decent definitive impressions that you've made. He's going to put a cast and scan it. And the wax rims are going to be allowing the lab technician to virtually mount these maxillary and mandible cast that he just scanned. So he wants to know where the midline is. He wants to know the lip support. Um, he wants to know where the canine are going to be. And, and, He's going to use everything to set the occlusal plane, uh, select the landmark on the virtual cast, determine the outlines of the future denture, and set up the teeth. And um, this is done by three shape um, with with the with the ivocular um, type of teeth. Um, these are these are SDCL teeth. Uh, you can use Fonaris teeth. You can use any teeth that ivocular has. And then what you do is the software will allow you to position the teeth exactly where you want them to be. Now, the, the technician is going to share with you a virtual image of the future dentures. So all what you need to do is to look at it and approve it. And then once you approve, then what they do is they take the puck. And this happens to be an A1 uh, shade teeth with, um, a pink, um, uh, with a pink base. And then what you do, you, you stick it in the machine. And then what the, what the machine does is it starts milling the dentures because the puck has the teeth on one side and the base on the other side, and it's going to be milling uh, both at the same time. So here, this is the final stages of uh, refining uh, the teeth. The base has been already uh, milled. So after that, all what the technician does is he takes the um, denture out from the, from the puck holder and then cut the sprues off polishes the dentures and send it to you. And this is what you could get. You notice that there's no junction between the teeth and the white teeth and the pink material. So there will be no debonding of teeth. There's been no staining of teeth. Uh, we did uh, some studies at school that we, we realized that these, these monolithic dentures are very resistant to stain and they're very strong. Now you can tell me that what if the teeth break, patient drop his dentures, the, the dentures are repairable because this is PMMA, uh, contrary to printed dentures that are made of composite, they're not repairable. So a printed denture, if it falls on the floor and breaks, you have to make a new one. These ones are repairable. And this is how it looks in the uh, patient's mouth. So 
CAT CAM dentures have made it so easy for us. We can also use it with um, immediate um, cases. Like if you want, you have somebody that needs an ICD, that could be done. It could be done very easy. And the good thing about that, if a patient now decides to move forward, now because you have the data in the software, you can go ahead and you can print um, a surgical guide and then take it from there. What you need to know also in order to determine the aesthetics is you need to use the, the papilla meter and um, just to, to measure basically the distance from the incisal papilla to the uh, border of the lip. And that gives you the residual ridge uh, crest to upper or lower lip measurement. And then what basically it does is it tells you where the incisal edge of the teeth is going to be. Then you ask for the patient to smile. And when, when the lip retract, then you measure that too. And that gives you where the neck of the teeth needs to be. So you can give the lab technician an excellent measurement for them to know. So again, at repose, um, you determine if the prosthesis mucosal junction will be visible when, this, when they smile. Why is that? Because if a patient smiles, no teeth, and you can see the gums, that means if you put the implants in a hybrid, it's going to be a lot of gum showing. So at that stage, you would know that you probably would need to cut some of the bone to lift up the implants higher and to, to get the denture to go a little bit higher so that uh, prosthesis mucosal junction is not visible. Anterior aesthetic tooth display helps determine the occlusal plane location. And, and then a lot of things play a role in the determination of that is the race, gender, the lip thickness, and the age. One way to measure if you have enough room for your hybrid, if a patient is wearing already a denture when he comes to your office, you can take some tin foil, put them on the teeth, and then when the patient grabs his um, CBCT, you notice that the opacity, um, the tinfoil creates an opacity in the CBCT, then you can measure the distance from the incisal edge to the uh, head of the implant. Um, in that case, you notice that there was a 10.52 millimeters uh, for the anterior and the posterior, it was 15.31 millimeter. So this is, this is kind of a quick way <clears throat> to determine that. The other way is to do it digitally. Um, you grab a CBCT, uh, impressions that you digitize, then you put everything in a planning software, you put all the details, and then you get uh, use a 3D printer just to print your surgical guide, and you can print also in an in uh, temporary hybrid, and and then go take all what you want from there. One other way to do it also is grab the patient existing dentures, and uh, get these uh, speedy marks. Um, these you can buy on Amazon. They're very cheap. They just like $25 a box. So what you do is you stick them on the dentures. And then what you do, two things, is you scan the dentures alone. And then you scan the dentures when the patient is wearing them. So what that does is it gives you an image of the denture. And it gives you the bowls. You can notice in the CBCT, the bowls where the dentures were supposed to be. But because the acrylic... Um, does not show on the CBCT. So all that you're going to see is the, is the ball. So what you do now is you superimpose these. And then now what you can do is figure out from there, um, I'm sorry, to figure out from there how much room you have from the, um, from the incisal edge all the way to the bone. Now, the vertical space requirements varies depending on the prosthesis that you're going to be doing. If you're doing an over-denture with a bar, um, basically is different than if you're doing a hybrid. Um, um, the framework design also differs, but ideally um, for, for an over-denture with the bar, you want a 17 to 20 millimeter of vertical space. Now, how do we determine that? If you look at the drawing there on the extreme right, you notice you want three millimeter of bi biologic width, four millimeter substructure, I, you know, sometimes they're plus or minus. You have a 3.2 millimeter for the locator for bar, you, can, you need two millimeters of acrylic on top of that in order not to break, and you have the teeth. So that's ideally how much you want. Now, if you're aiming for a metal ceramic uh, implant fix complete dentures, ideally you want also 15 to 20 millimeters. And then um, if you're aiming for an all ceramic, now the, the, it's totally different because 
you can go with a with smaller vertical here, 14 to 16 millimeter. And the way we measure that is you get a two millimeter of biologic width, um, two to five millimeter of pink material, and you have 10 to 11 millimeter of teeth. And that's how um, um, you know the, these, these measurements came about. Um, the most important thing when you're doing all ceramic implant fixed complete denture is the connector size. Um, I published a chapter not a long time ago with a friend of mine, and we looked at all the connector sizes that are available and recommended on the market. Now, we know we came up with our own, and we noticed that yeah, if you if you have a four units or more, and you have two anterior pontics, in the maxilla, you want approximately seven millimeters square. But and notice the more posterior you go, the bigger the connector size. So again, if you're too tight on on interarch on vertical space, what's going to happen is you're going to have to make these connectors smaller, and that's what puts the the um, the hybrid into jeopardy and into a lot of load. So that, again, it's it's extremely important to take all of these into consideration. Bone volume is extremely important. When you lose teeth, what happens is you have a palatal resorption and the reduction in height of the alveolar process. The maxilla resorbs centripetally, which means it, it shrinks, and the mandible resorbs uh, centrifugally. And what happens is the patient is going to be in a like a pseudo class three situation. So it's important that when you want to embark into an implant fixed complete denture, you have to look at that and how long has the patient been a dentulous, mount the case on an articulator to be able to assess that relationship of implant to ideal inside the ledge. Now, if you look at that patient, look where the maxillary bone is and look where the mandible teeth are. So, which means that if you put the teeth um, in, a, in a regular overjet overbite situation, you're going to have a huge cantilever, and that's what happened with him. It broke. So, implant overdenture with denture flanges in that particular case would be more favorable biomechanically. So, again, don't promise your patient anything before you do a little bit of a homework and a little bit of data gathering so because you don't want to promise that patient let's say oh i'm going to give you a hybrid and then say oh well middle of the way you tell him i'm sorry i'm going to give you a removable denture so they get mad at you so look at the maxillary lip support look, look at the facial contour and then and then um, if you design an implant over denture with flanges you can get an ideal maxillary lip support because you can push the teeth as far forward as you want. Then the facial contour is going to get better. And also you're going to reduce the implant overload because you're going to have a bar and then the, the, the denture is going to be fitting on the bar itself. Now, that's what I told you. Meanwhile, you have to see how much gum display that patient has. Now, these people, what they did is they didn't even look at that. They fabricated the ICD and the patient gets that and she was mad. Well, of course she's going to get mad. Ideally, what you want to do with this is cut the bone, put the implant a little bit higher and give yourself um, a good vertical space. So short lip to ridge distance is an issue. Uh, visible prosthesis border is an issue and, and border trap uh, the lips. Um, if it's If it's too short, the lip is going to get caught into the border all the time and the patient is going to have a lot of difficulties. The other problem with short clip to ridge distance is um, you, the lab technician is going to have to end up adding more acrylic on the buckle to hide the gums, and by doing that, making it for the patient excessively difficult to clean. Um, you notice here the flanges are so high, patient couldn't clean, and he got into some other issues, um, tissue inflammation and probably some bone loss. Let's talk a little bit about the number of implants when you, what you need for an implant fixed complete denture. There is little evidence to support that implant number as a factor of patient satisfaction. Now, it's satisfying for us because we make more money, but for the patient, if you go with four or six or eight, it doesn't make a difference, they're satisfied the same way. So evidence does show that simple rather than complex designs that allow for ease of maintenance and cleaning are preferred by the patient. Patient prefer when they get an older, they have dexterity issues, visual issues, they can't see much. It's very important for them to have something easy to clean. 
if you give them these sophisticated stuff, they have a difficulty to clean. So four to six implants have successfully been used in both arches. The anterior posterior spread and the cantilever is extremely important to look at also, specifically if the implant have been placed previously by somebody else and the patient presents to you, you have to look at these, uh, this, this factor is very important. The mandible, the recommendation that cantilevers may extend uh, at most to one and a half uh, times the anterior posterior spread was empirically established. In a chapter that I co-authored with some of, um, of my colleagues, we did the research to find out how that number came, came to existence. Now, we found an article published in England and that guy basically just didn't do any research. He just empirically put out that number. So it should be modified um, so that, that cantilever, I mean, should be modified by the estimated applied forces. Uh, look at parafunction, look at skeletal form, look at the opposing dentition and the number of implants. Now you look at these uh, images here, the first um, hybrid on the left side, you notice that the cantilever are so big and notice how on the buckle all the porcelain chipped. And then you, you look the one on the top, the implants are, are a straight line. And then these cantilevers are so big that they kept causing fracture of the screws. And on the lower one on the right side, you notice that the cantilever is so inadequate that it broke the framework. So in the maxilla, it is very important to spread the implant in a way um, that you can only get one time the anterior posterior span. Now, again, ideally, if you push the, the implants a little bit more posterior, then you wouldn't need any cantilevers. If you can avoid them, it's much better. So that's why now we use tilted implants, um, and that gives us, expands the posterior anterior spread and push it a little bit backward so that to avoid using cantilevers. Or the best way is to distalize the implant as much as possible to avoid using cantilevers. Location and angulation of the implants. Um, these are old cases. Um, the one on the left side, I should say, is an old case. I understand they didn't have um, appropriate um, imaging at that time, and everything was done you know, by eyeballing and you notice where the implant are and then where the, the position of the teeth is, and that creates a lot of cantilever. But the case on the right side is recent, and that was referred uh, to me to, to say, please fabricate implant fix complete dentures, and I will look at that, but this is wishful thinking. Uh, the implants are placed you know, in such a bad way that there was no way I could use these implants. So again, they should be planning. The lab technicians now have all the tools and the, the uh, programs and the softwares to help you design uh, the implant placement ideally where they need to be to be able to give you um, a prosthesis that fits well, biomechanically is convenient and doesn't put a lot of load on the implants. Now, one such system is the smile in the box from Strauman where they take your CBCT and they take all the information that you have including a cast, including teeth and everything, or dentures, and they fabricate for you all what you want. A bone reduction guide, a surgical guide for placing of the implants, and, and then um, the, the interim uh, IFCD. And, and again, they send you all the components. And then micro, uh, microdental can do the same. They can also help you design your, your cases in order to avoid any issues. Let's look now at the choice of framework design. If you want to go with hybrids, you can have some hybrid bars. Um, these are fixed bar designs with, the, with an increased retention surface. You notice that there's either grooves, there could be some, some pins, there could be some T-bars, just to give you excess retention. Again, um, this, the design of these bars depends on the vertical space that you have. That's why the lab technician is not going to fabricate any of this if you don't have at least a trial denture that you can use as a guide, because he needs to figure out the height of this bar, but also he needs to figure out also because you need some acrylic on top and the teeth, if you're going with a wraparound acrylic, but if you're going with the zirconia, it's the same thing. He needs to know how much vertical you have to be able to find out if this is feasible or not. You can also use the press CVH bars uh, or freedom bars. These are for removable dental prosthesis. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I did a beautiful 
uh, bar with uh, with Rob Cryer at Microdental, uh, similar to the one on the right side, uh, with an overdenture on top. These are very um, uh, predictable, um, easy for the patient to clean because the bars are designed with a lot of room underneath to have the patient uh, put a plexa brush or a water pick, and then the dentures that go on top is now um, th there's a housing that goes on top of the bar, and then the ivotion which is a monolithic denture that Rob made, and then it's glued to the framework. And this way, everything is solid. The, the monolithic denture, there will be no debonding of teeth. That's what we had as a complication a couple of years ago. But now with the iVotion system or a monolithic denture system, this problem is solved. You can also have some telescopic bars or abutment hybrids. The telescopic bars is a bar with the housing on top and the teeth are bonded to this and then the abutment hybrid is a framework and you have some zirconia teeth that are bonded and then the base is either made of ceramics or composite now you can also have a, a, a chrome a cobalt chromium a bridge for for direct veneering that means the lab technician will take that and veneers ceramic right on top with uh, the pink ceramic at the bottom or, or composite uh, just to show a case here, um, this is Johnny was supposed to lose all his maxillary teeth periodontally involved. The first thing I did is get him an ICD. Uh, once the ICD was done, then we started planning for the implant. Um, I planned four implants in the maxilla, two in the premolar area, and you notice they tilted just in order for me to push that um, anterior posterior spread further in the back and avoid the use of cantilevers or minimize them, I should say, also. Now, after that, um, the screw retained abutment was used, temporary cylinder placed on top, and the conversion denture was made. So I took his existing ICD and I converted into a temporary IFCD. And then once it's polished and its occlusion is adjusted and delivered, and you notice that uh, there's a minimum cantilever, which is basically one tooth, and this is much safer for the end result. Once he healed, uh, I made a definitive impression. Always grab an X-ray when you make an impression to make sure that the, the dentures are fitting, um, I mean, the impression copings are fitting uh, on the implants, and the verification jig is crucial. Now, I don't care how you make your verification jig, but make one. Um, some people use composite, some people use Duralay, we use uh, pieces of metal so everything is okay provided that you do one just to make sure that what you have in the mouth is what you have on a cast i mean is accurate and resembles what you have in the mouth so this is the cast after the verification jig is done the cast is scanned the immediate um, the temporary uh, hybrid is scanned and then after that the lab technician is going to send me temporary final just for me to have a look at it it's it, it's usually helpful to establish the incisor length uh, correct the midline if they if it's off or the cunt if it's off uh, because you don't want them to go to the final if if you don't get one of these blueprint at least to make sure that what you're going to get is correct the incisor line angles um you, it's going to help you correct the incisor and posterior planes if they're a little bit off and gently test the incisal guidance. So once you have that, then the lab technician is going to finalize your case. And here, what they did is they designed and milled my uh, my wraparound bar. Um, studies have shown that CAT CAM frameworks have been found to fit more accurately than cast um, than cast with gold alloys. Now, in the old days, we always had to cut and solder because they will never fit. Now, don't forget when you, in the old days, we used to wax these bars and cast them. And along the process, there's shrinkage and deformities and everything. So we always ended up with, with some defects at the end. This is how when you, when you try it intraorally. And then the most important thing when you do that is do a very, um, um, a one screw test to make sure that it's fitting properly and, we, and we'll talk a little bit about that shortly then the lab technician is going to take this frame and it's gonna here you see he scanned the temporary um, ifcd that the patient is wearing and because i sent him a copy of that and then he's gonna mill 
from a monolithic block Ivotion, he's going to mill for me the base and the teeth, and he's going to mill a recess in the intaglio surface of the, the denture where then my framework is going to fit. So this is how it looks just after milling. There's no polishing, nothing that was done to it. And then this is the framework. So you see the framework fix very, fits very intimately in the intaglio surface of the milled uh, Ivotion denture. The beauty, again, the beauty of this is there's no deep, there will be no debonding of your teeth. And the other beauty, if something went wrong, let's say where, uh, let's say, I don't know, uh, uh, for any reason something fractures, all that you have to do is call the lab, they mill another one, and then send it to you. So this is um, a pre-op and post-op. And um, you notice when you do the, the um, all you, you data gathering and you follow the basic principles of removable prosthodontics, there's no way you can go wrong. Um, aesthetically, it will look very nice. Now, framework must be fabricated for materials and protocol that allow passive and accurate fit between the frameworks and the implant. And that's why uh, here comes the, the, um, the um, they should be designed to resist tensile and compressive forces associated with mastication and parafunctional habits. So how do you do that? So what you do is, once you put the framework in the mouth, you tighten four screws or five screws, all the screws, then just by hand. Then what you do is you loosen all of them except for one. And then you grab an X-ray. And if there is a, um, a gap between the, the metal uh, of the, um, the framework and the, the, the implant that, that tells you that, that the, the framework has been under compression to fit in place. It's not fitting passively. What happens is when you loosen, the, the framework should stay be fitting on the implant. If you see any gap, that means something is off. Then what you have to do is you verify that your cast is correct by redoing a verification jig if you haven't done, done one before. So framework misfit can cause stresses not only in the implant, in the prosthesis and the surrounding bone. And you notice here, these are three different frameworks. And you notice that they're not fitting. That's why it's important to grab x-rays all along. And it's important not to move to the final before you make sure that the framework fits correctly. Don't, don't rely on the screw to fit your framework on the implant. It's going to be under tension. And because of that, the implant is going to be under tension and you probably will lose bone. Passivity causes the long-term osseointegration of the implant. So passivity is extremely important for your success, long-term success. So for the misfit, again, it's important to make sure that your cast is accurate. So what I do usually is I make an impression and um, I make a, just a regular impression of the implants and then I pull my cast, then put the impression copings on the cast, join them with the floss, either the relay or compile, whatever you want. Then you take that out and go back to the mouth and try to make sure if it fits. If it doesn't fit, that means your cast is wrong. But ideally, what you want to do is do the reverse. So which means put the impression copings in the mouth, bond them with, uh, with the floss, I mean, put a floss around and put, put some composite or duralay and let it set. Now, this is the, the jig that fits perfectly in your mouth. Then you take it out and go try it on your cast. If the cast doesn't, if it doesn't fit on the cast, cast is off. What you want to do then is take these impression copings, um, put them on the, on the implants, and they bond it together now, and then make an impression with these. So not only you have the impressions of the tissues and the bone, but also a verification jig that fits into your impression material. So the one screw shuffled fit test does not work for non-planar implant connection. So, um, so how do you check the passive fit? You do a modified one screw fit test, like I just told you. So the framework on implants, all screwed in, then what you do is you screw with the same torque from the center. So you start at the middle and you go and then you, you tighten with the same force. Then you unscrew all of them except for one. And then you grab x-rays and check, check the, 
the fit or the gaps on all connections without screws. And then this way you can make sure that you've got um, something that that uh, that uh, fits properly. So as a summary, um, it is important to uh, master basic principles of removable and implant prosthodontics. Um, the advantages of the digital workflow for clinician and dental technician um, needs to be understood. It, it is important that you understand that digital dentistry is very accurate and it's your benefit to get into digital dentures and, and digital dentistry. Now, I understand that it might be a little bit expensive at the beginning as an investment to invest into um, uh, an intraoral scanner, but long-term, it's profitable for you and it's beneficial for your patients. Now, um, again, you, 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 that's why also with digital um, dentures and any type of digital work that you're gonna do, the communication with you and the lab is extremely important. Um, you, you need to, to get that going much, much fluent. Um, there should be guidelines for decision-making. Again, if you want to do um, any type of work, an overdenture or a hybrid, um, an ac acrylic or hybrid zirconia, they just, just make sure that you start from the beginning and then put for yourself a checklist that things you need to do. So check the, the vertical space. Patient, let's say, doesn't have a denture. You have to make a new denture, take it to the wax rims, um, and then either put some, if you want to go analog, put some teeth in, try it, make sure that it, it is, you know, it's accurate aesthetically, phonetically, um, um, the vertical dimension is correct. And then, then the technician is going to take you from there all the way to the other steps. If you want to go digital, you just have to stop at the wax rims. The lab technician is going to send you a printed trial denture that you can try. The only difficulty with the printed de trial dentures is you can't move the teeth. The only thing you can do is shorten the teeth, um, mark the midline with a Sharpie pen, grind the occlusal plane if you have to adjust it. Um, you know, these are the kind of things you can do. Now, if if you do some occlusal adjustments on it, or let's say you, you close the vertical a little bit, the lab technician is gonna have to scan that and readjust virtually everything to according to what you've done intraorally. That's why it's important also to communicate with the lab, tell him what you did. Uh, hey, John, I adjusted the occlusion. The flanges were too long. I shortened them uh, in the retromolar height fossa. So he knows what you did. So he can rescan the dentures and adjust for the final one. And also um, material wise, Again, you need to go, to know where you're going. And the, uh, the best important thing to know is you need to know how much it's going to cost you because this is going to affect how much you're going to charge the patient. So imagine if you charge, uh, let's say, $2,000 for an overdenture, and then what happens is, is your lab bill is $3,000. You're going to be paying from your own pocket. That's why it's important to kind of understand how much would it cost you but all the steps from the components, if you don't have them, to the lab analogs, to to um, the wax rims, and every single step, you have to figure these out to charge accordingly. And and that's that's I see a lot of colleagues they they call me and they say, well, I was surprised the lab bill was that expensive, and I didn't charge enough. So again, you have to do your homework and to figure out how much all of these things cost you, so you can charge accordingly. And again, uh, and we sometimes forget that if you don't do implants, there's the cost of the implant and the surgery and then the surgical guide. So that adds up. So that's why it's important that you have a, a very honest communication with your patient. Say, okay, my fees are going to be this much. And then you have to add to that the surgical fees. And sometimes patients will look at you and then they roll their eyes and then they'll, they'll could buy me a, a new car. That I understand, but you have to, Pick your priorities. And again, um, if you plan you 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 um if you plan your case, you won't get into any hurdles. People get in trouble because they never do the initial homework. And the initial homework is the understanding of complete denture 
prosthetics. And that's why at the beginning I started with that, just to make you aware that you still need to learn how to do these indentures. You still need to know the basics. Uh, and so, so this way you won't get in trouble and then you'll be, you have a, a very nice fluent um, conversation with the lab technician. With this, I just want to thank all of you. If you have any um, questions later, you can email me, um, nbaba at llu.edu. I won't promise you a quick response, but I will respond to you. And uh, you can follow me on Instagram, on Facebook. And with this, um, I'd be more than happy to entertain some questions if you have any.